odd because what did God do? He made the world. What else? Who else did he make? He made us, right. And he made all the animals. And he made all of the things that there are. That's right, he made everything here. He made the trees that the wood stuff's made out of. He's, he made the, the petroleum that the carpet's made out of. Even the water, yep. Yep, he did. Okay. Yep, he made the land. You ready to hear about, does God have a big toe? Here, I'll show you the picture. It's kind of a cute picture. See, cute picture, Tower of Babel and all the people. So, okay. Long ago, all the people lived in one place called Babel. Yep, Babel. Not only did every person live in the same place, but every person spoke the same language. All of which made life very easy. Getting the news was easy. Okay, guys. Let's... Thank you. I appreciate that. Getting the news was easy, and you didn't have to learn a new language in high school. You guys learn any new, do you guys, you guys do you watch the, the, the cartoons that teach you Spanish? No? no? Yeah, I like Dora. Hmm? Like Dora. What else? Uh, Sesame Street used to teach some Spanish, too. Oh, yeah. But, uh, I like Marshall. Oh, you like Marshall, okay. I'm bad Doesn't teach. Okay. Okay. But, you ready? Let's finish. But Ariana's question changed all that. Ariana asked, Mommy, I have a big toe, and you have a big toe, and Daddy has a big toe. Does God have a big toe? Yes. Yes. Now, everything might have been fine if Ariana's mother had just replied, Ariana, God is not a person. God is special and invisible and wonderful, and God is the creator of the universe. God has made each of us in God's image, but God is not a person. And that is why God does not have a big toe. But Ariana's mother was busy with something and said, go ask your father. Have you ever had your mother ask, tell you that? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep. So, she did, but Ariana's father was also busy with something, and he told her, go ask your grandpa. So she did. Grandpa was in his garden digging up weeds with his pal, Fred, who worked at the king's palace. Ariana asked, Gram ask, Grandpa, I have a big toe, Mommy has a big toe, Daddy has a big toe, you have a big toe, Fred has a big toe. Does God have a big toe? You have a big toe, don't you? Okay. We all do. Right. When Ariana's grandpa, now, Ariana's grandpa was old and a little hard of hearing, and he said, does God have a big hoe? Why, I don't know if God has a big hoe. I suppose if God has a garden, then God must have a big hoe. After all, you can't rid the weeds without a hoe. Fred whispered to Ariana, that he would ask the king the next day at work. The king thought and thought and then issued a proclamation. You, the people of Babel, will build a tower up to the sky so that I, your king, can stand on top of this tower and look at God's foot. Then I will tell you if God has a big toe. The king ordered the builders to use only the best bricks and the best tar to stick them together. The Tower of Babel grew higher and higher every day. Now, God knew that if everybody was working on the tower, nobody would be in the fields growing things like food to eat. Nobody would be in their shops making things like furniture. God knew that soon all the bricks and tar in Babel would be used up and the people in Babel would have nothing left to build homes. God thought about just knocking down the tower, but God knew for sure that the Babelians would just build it up again to see if God had a big toe. There was only one thing to do. 
The next day, when Ariana came to watch the work on the tower, she heard Fred ask his friend for a brick, and his friend said, ma a ta rozi and turned to another guy with tar who said, arigato, and asked a guy with a shovel who said, como esta, and looked at the guy with the fellow with the wheelbarrow who said, gesundheit. Soon, bricks and tar were flying everywhere. And by the end of the day, people who spoke the same language were heading out of town together. Ariane and her family decided to leave town too with Fred, Grandpa, and a few other people that they could understand. They packed up everything they owned and left Babel. On the cart, Ariana was quiet for quite a while, and then she asked, Mommy, I have a belly button, and you have a belly button, and Daddy has a belly button. Does God have a belly button too? You do? Oh, I'm so glad. We all do, but we still don't know if God does or not. Do we know if God has a big toe? You think so? Well, I think Jesus has a big toe, so that's part of God, so God probably does have a big toe. But you have to be careful the kinds of questions you ask because you may not want to know the answer to them. Now, Ariana wanted the answer, but I don't think she expected the outcome of ending up leaving town, speaking a different language. So be careful the questions you ask. But if you have a real question, you need to ask it because that's important. Any question that you don't ask is the one that you might miss out on. So always ask God, ask your parents, ask your grandparents. That works too. Sometimes you can even ask your brothers and sisters. God bless you. Yeah. God. Yeah. Well, I doubt God has a big toe. Jesus has the big toe because he was human. But I think God is, is a spirit, and he, in, he, he incorporates everything. So, Okay, you ready to pray? Don't bite your brother, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can learn about asking questions and being careful about what we ask. Father, we ask that you would bless these children as they go to blast and enjoy sharing time with one another. We ask that you would continue to be with them as they grow and learn about you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, scripture comes from the book of Genesis, the 11th chapter. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with the top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, look, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from the there over the face of all of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad the face of all the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Think of it, a tower that reaches to the very heights of heaven. And all it took was one little girl, according to our story, that asked, does God have a big toe? And we thought that we had big amb ambitions. This one takes the cake, wins the prize, earns the blue ribbon. 100 years ago, a man named Daniel Burnham laid out the plan for the modern city of Chicago. The beauty of the lakefront with the green space, bike trails, beaches reflects his vision. He summed it up in his philosophy in two famous sentences. Make no small plans. They have no power to stir men's blood. The Tower of Babel was the ancient power game for people who felt the inner need to be number one. 
so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered across the face of the whole earth, was what they said. Make no small plans. Good advice if you're building a world-class city like Chicago. Think big, plan big, dream big. Today, Chicago is the largest city between the two coasts and becoming what one writer calls a global city. With a vibrant inner core teeming with millions of eager people who actually enjoy living in a city. Make no small plans. That's why the Sears Tower dominates the skyline and landscapes from every angle. And that's why we have two professional baseball teams to go along with a professional basketball team, football team, and hockey team, and two world-class private universities plus medical schools, seminaries, and law schools. Make no small plans. Daniel Burnham would have loved the Tower of Babel. That was right up his alley. Let's build a tower that reaches into the heavens. Great idea. Let's use bricks instead of stones. Then they will last forever. I'll call the bank and set up financing. We'll borrow most of the money at a prime plus one rate and the city council will float a bond issue for the rest. We'll rent out the top floor of the tower for multinational corporations We'll rent out the middle floors for families to live in, and the bottom floor will be for retail. I love it. The tower will stand forever. We'll be the envy of every city in Mesopotamia. They don't have anything like this in Nineveh. It's a great idea. People will come from everywhere to see our tower. We can make money leading tours of our tower. Make no small plans. No one ever tried to do anything like this before or since. This was the greatest building program of the ancient world. But the tower they started was stopped by God, and it eventually fell to the ground. Let me repeat that another way. They started the tower, God stopped it. And along the way, he confused their language and scattered the people across the face of the earth. In order to understand our story a little better, there's a little background that you need. First, the story of the Tower of Babel occurred just a few generations after Noah's flood. It may have been 100 to 150 years, but by this time the population of the world expanded to somewhere around 30,000 people living on the earth at the time. Second, in those days, everyone spoke the same language. The fact that we learned in verse 1 is crucial to understanding this passage of scripture. The human race was united as the human race had never been united before nor since. At a glance, the religious nature of the tower they built may seem to make it quite different from modern skyscrapers. But perhaps there really isn't much difference at all. Think about it. After the collapse of the World Trade Center, and the two towers, all one heard was they were described as temples of modern commerce and shrines to the ingenuity and the prowess of American technology. But this is not unusual. Mount Rushmore is called the shrine of American democracy. It should not be surprised that, there, that when men build anything great, they invest with symbolic religious significance. Buildings, statues, monuments, all say something about the values of those who build them and those who support them. The Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument say something about the power and positive about the values we hold in America. So was a tower, but it was more than a tower. It was massive, united effort to bring humanity together wholly apart from God. Is it any wonder that the Lord would not let the tower stand? The compulsive drive for power and prestige stems from a deep-seated fear of dependence on someone else. At this point, we need to ponder carefully the implications of our story. Is there anything wrong with building a tower? No. 
Is there anything wrong with working together to build a tower? No. Is it wrong to advertise that your, power, your tower is the tallest tower on Earth? No. But at this point, we're drifting into a little bit of danger zone, one that is so subtle that we hardly see it until it captures us completely. Human pride is a tricky thing. Pride is what made Lucifer rebel against God in the first place and get him thrown out of heaven. Pride was the original sin of the universe. Ambition is not wrong. Competition is not wrong. Winning isn't wrong. Celebrating your victories is not wrong. But the best is not wrong, but it is never entirely innocent either. Sin always lurks in the neighborhood somewhere. You all know that. Even in our own minds, sin lurks and plays around. That's why Jesus declared that it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. When we've got money or power or prestige or fame or friends in high places, you think you don't need God. But when you're flat broke and your power is gone and your friends won't return your phone calls, you're on your knees crying out for mercy. Unfortunately, I have to think about the two current presidential nominees. We need to pray for both of them, that somewhere God will get a hold of them and straighten them out. Because neither one of them have a clue about who is really going to put them in power. And it's not their fame, not their prestige, not their family standings. It's God. There is a kind of uneasy paranoia about being on the top of the heap. It's striking that people of Babel fear being scattered even though there was no reason to fear anything. Back then, there was nothing to fear. God had put them there, and God was keeping them there. Life is hard without God. You ever tried to live without God? Do you remember when you lived without God? I don't know about you, but I can remember. It was not easy. And occasionally in my life, I have sort of strayed from God, and things never went quite as right as what they were when I kept God as my BFF. For those of you that don't know, BFS means best friends forever. Um, but it's one of those things that without God, life doesn't work well. You end up doing desperate things, like building towers that reach into the heavens. Arrogance makes people think they are invincible, but no one is invincible. And that's why God stopped the building program. If he let them continue with the tower, they would think they could do anything. What's the saying? Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely? We've seen that throughout the centuries. Never easy, never good. So God confounds their language. The pipe fitters couldn't understand the electricians, who couldn't understand the truck drivers, who didn't have a clue what the bricklayers were talking about, and that drove the carpenters nuts. Everyone started talking gibberish. No one understood a thing the others were saying. So soon, the massive building program ground to a screeching halt. Then the Lord scattered them across the face of the earth. And do you know what that the city that was with an unfinished tower was eventually on the ground? They called it Babel because that means confusion. They called it Confusion City. I think we are sitting in the midst of a confusion nation. I think we are some of the most confused people right now 
because we don't know quite where to turn. I don't know about you, I know where to turn quite regularly, and that's to God, because he can make a difference in the world. Everyone in Babel was babbling at the same time. It drove them all nuts, and so they moved away to get some peace and quiet. And that's how we ended up with so many different languages. Interesting. Here is the ultimate story. They built the tower so they wouldn't be scattered, but they ended up scattered anyway. Thus does God judge halt human efforts that leave him out. He brings down the high and the mighty with a great big thud. Right over this story, the words from the book of Psalms, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. It's okay to make big plans, but ask God about what he wants in those plans. Whether you're an individual, a family, a church, a city, a state, a nation, ask God what he wants first because then he will lead you to where you need to go. Or you could end up like the people in Babel, scattered with nothing to show for all of your efforts. We build towers that crumble before our eyes and we wonder what went wrong. We're too busy building over our kingdoms to seek first the kingdom of God. No wonder we're frazzled, tired, nervous, uptight, jumpy, irritable, easily distracted, and easily seduced by money, sex, and power. It's not easy to keep on track. The people said, come, let's build. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. If you are tired of building castles in the sand only to see them washed away by the tides of life, come to Jesus. If you are weary and failing to be the master of your own circumstances, come to Jesus. If you are burdened with the pressures of trying to be all things to all people all the time, and if you fail to meet your own expectations, much less everyone else's, come to Jesus. If you are worn out from the fruitless search of power and prestige, come to Jesus. Here is the word for the frustrated tower builders everywhere. If you are tired of your life and want something better, come to Jesus. All that hunger, hungry hearts seek is found in him. By his death on the cross, our sins are forgiven. By his resurrection, we gain new life. Do you know him? Has your heart been changed by his mighty power? If you are tired, tired of building power, towers that fall to the ground, come to Jesus. He's the firm foundation, the cornerstone that can never be shaken. Build your life on Jesus Christ and you will never be disappointed. Make big plans. But don't forget, you need to come to Jesus first. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus taught us great things as he lived, that God in his Old Testament taught us great things about what we are to be about in this world. We pray, Father, that you will lead us this week to help us share Jesus with those who are lonely and weary and need an uplifting word. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.